Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Looking for a career change? Tenable Network Security is hiring everything from programmers to researchers. Check out all of the available positions at securityweekly.com forward slash tenable jobs. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. This is the 10-year anniversary show. We are here live in studio. Sorry, did I, did I say that too loud? It was a little bit. It was a little loud. Shocked me. Sorry. I, was, I I'm, peed myself just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, wake up, John. At least wake you didn't up. break your chair. Uh, we want to welcome back to the show. Uh, Ron was actually very early on interview on the show. He's been a supporter of the show for quite some time. He is, I'm told, frequently sought up a media publication and I, I told you that, right? <laughs> such as the New York Times, Bloomberg, and Forbes. Ron is a leader, a leading cybersecurity thinker, innovator, and visionary in the information security industry. I spell c- cyber with a C. <laughs> cyber with a C. Hey, so so Paul, just to you know, it's ten year anniversary, and I want to throw it back just a just a bit. Do you I remember know what that? you're going back to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because no, I don't remember. I rely on you. Uh, yes. Do you remember the time that we, the first time Ron was on the yes. podcast? No. And but. we interviewed you. Interviewed him. Yes. And hire we me. had drank Please, Ron, second me. the entire bottle of Saint Bernard's Twelve. It was this a really high alcohol content beer, and they kept pouring. I don't know if I ever told you the story. I must have at this point. They kept pouring. I had like the never-ending glass of, of beer. high alcohol content high beer. Al- and it, by the time we got to the Ron Kula interview, Paul was slurring his words. He was yeah. so drunk. <laughs> and you I, still I hired him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you still hired him. I remember that's Ron, Ron that's never fabulous. noticed, though, because it, I always just slur my speech. <laughs> <laughs> Ron's like, yeah, that's how I don't fall. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I remember nice. whenever you called me up and you're like, I got some big news. I'm going to go work for Tenable. I'm like, oh, my God. How is how is that going to happen? <laughs> I can't believe Ron's actually going to hire you. <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> iconic <laughs> moments. And to do what? Could. And Ron's been asking me the same yeah. question <laughs> for and, years. And, you know, that was one of the few times after the podcast, because we hadn't eaten, No, because we were in the, the one of the subvert locations at that point. We were at the hospital <laughs> right. in one of the conference rooms, and we went to dinner afterwards. Yeah, yeah big, yes. mistake. Yeah, big, yeah, big mistake. Big, big mistake. I tell you, right, Ron? Some people watch the video. <laughs> he's, he's quiet because he doesn't remember it. Yeah. He's just like, mm. we have in studio with us also very, very special person uh, to the show. Allison Nixon Ooh. is here with Hi, us. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hey. Oh, my gosh. Thank I tell you, you what, I, we get a lot of email that says, where's Allison? I oh, my gosh. So, so much. much. Now she's here. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> Prophecy fulfilled. Uh, so, Ron, uh, how are you doing today? Good. I'm here to interview you. Happy 10-year anniversary. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh. <laughs> wow. Let me just Some roll back. Some people have turned the tables. Oh, They're totally dare. fine. It's totally fine. <laughs> so, uh, Ron, I, I guess I'm going to start out. Uh, I'll start with the easy question. What's your favorite part about being the CEO of Tenable? Oh, my gosh. Um, we're actually making a difference, I think. We uh, help people identify you know, what's wrong on their network, and most of them actually try to fix things, right? And they have a good, good job what's going on, and it's, it's a good thing. The issue is that uh, the networks keep changing, right? Every time people get a handle on it, there's something new, right? There's cloud, there's mobile, there's things like that. But I actually do think we're helping people. Mm-hmm. What's changed most about vulnerability management in the past 10 years? Oh, my goodness. Um, it's a weapon system now. Honest to God, there's, really? I mean, I, without without saying that you're, evil cyber word, right? You're going to you have know? to clarify that because <laughs> yeah, but there's a whole lot export, of pen export test control, yeah, export there. control. <laughs> Let's you know, get into it's that. a nation yeah. state thing, stuff like that. You know, if you see a funny packet, obviously it's a nation state, so the bad guys are after you and stuff like that. No, it's in front of mind of, of everybody, mm. and uh, that's the biggest thing that's changed. And uh, you know, one of these days we're going to wake up, the lights are going to be off, and all that kind of stuff. The cyber Pearl Harbor, all that kind of good stuff. It's, it's, drink, uh, drink, yes. yeah, drink, drink, drink. Yeah. All right, drink. Drink. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Cyber. So. cyber Pearl Harbor. You got to drink twice. That's sure, true. So, sure, sure. Wait, I, Pearl I, Harbor. I drank three times. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> you should do another so one. What, yeah. Ron, so, but what what are people doing to make the most of their vulnerability data? You said that you yeah. know, as you see, organizations actually responding to the mm-hmm. vulnerability data there's, uh, vulnerability programs. There's, there's three types of people out there, right? People who don't do anything, right? People who just count vulnerabilities and then don't, don't do anything with it. Mm-hmm. And then people who actually try to measure their risk and do something do something about it, make it better, right? Mm-hmm. I always talk about Fitbit for security, right? If, if you have Fitbit, 
you, it doesn't shock you if you eat too much, it doesn't inject you to make you sleep better, but if you measure everything, you can get better or see how worse you're getting, mm -hmm. um, looking around the table. Um, but the point is, is that a lot of people... <laughs> What are you saying? I'm not healthy? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm thinking my Fitbit's not working. Right? But, um, hey, you know. hey, I resemble that remark. <laughs> Round, I'm in shape. Round you know, of shape, no isn't it? No wonder I'm drinking this entire <laughs> show. No, nobody ever goes to work and says, hey, you know what? I don't have to go to work today. I'm done. Yeah, firewalls are good. Everything's patched. Mm. There's nothing on my network I can't explain. Every user's accounted for. But most people who get it know that it's, it's a journey. And uh, I hate to sound kind of. Uh, do we have to drink if I say journey? No. No. Um, but you know, but I hate you do have to drink if you start singing. Journey. There you yeah. go. Don't there you go. Stop believing. <laughs> or if you drink. Yeah. I'm on it. I'm on it. Cyber <laughs> journey. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so what's better, the intelligence we can gather from third-party threat intelligence, or the threat intelligence you can collect on your own Ooh. network? Yeah. So I like to throw out metrics, right? So if you are a consumer of indicators and you're finding indicators, that's one type of metric. If you're a producer of indicators, on the other hand, you're much better than most people. A lot of people tend to consume indicators and look around their network for them and then say, I'm secure because I don't have an indicator, versus other people who actually do have a decent security program and they say, oh, we're exploding you know, malware, finding C2C, we're finding zero days, we're finding things like that. Those are that group that leans forward and is, is trying to find uh, do, do, do security the right way. So the I, what you're saying is the people that are doing security the right way are actually contributing to the threat intelligence that yeah. other people yeah. are, are consuming. Oh, yeah. If you're just yeah. sitting back and consuming and, and, and aggregate, and granted, some people have to do that, right? If you're a major bank and you're getting attacked by everybody from nation states to your competitors and whatnot, you know, you've got to buy every, you have to do everything, every tool that's available to you, right? But the average person doesn't have the ability to buy everything. And what should they do? They should be, you know, trying to focus on finding the indicators, producing them themselves, and trying to have a sense of what security really is. Now, so, I, go ahead, John. I, I got to ask a question, um, because I'm not an employee of his. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, so if we go back a number of years ago, um, there, there was a time when you and I were hanging out, and uh, we were, like, fly fishing, and I think your son was throwing rocks in the, in the pond while we I, were fishing. I thought it was the strip clubs in Vegas you were going to go No, no, that's, that's a different time. <laughs> a different right. time. We're different not going different to story. that one. <laughs> Hi, honey. I love you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you said at that time passive vulnerability assessment was something that was just kind of kicking up, yep. right? And you said, I believe that we're going to be able to detect the vast majority of vulnerabilities through passive vulnerability assessment. And it seems like in the industry there's a whole bunch of things where, like, the entire industry is following a certain path, and then there's tenable. And I'm not saying this just to kind of kiss your ass, but <laughs> it seems like there's these times where Tenable is kind of playing off in this weird field that isn't like where everybody else is going. Like passive vulnerability assessment is one of those things. No one was doing that. The closest thing was Bro, and they were just doing inventory. And then you got like anomaly detection on the networks, and then you got asset discovery, being able to know what's on your network and find what's going on. And then I mentioned, you know, we do a lot of that stuff in in, in whenever we're doing our pen test and vulnerability mm -hmm. sessions, looking for the anomalies on the network far more than vulnerabilities because that's more interesting to us as attackers. So whenever you guys are, are working, um, is it just complete insanity and you come up with these ideas? <laughs> or you know, how do you guys actually come to these conclusions? Like, well, uh, How does your team come up with an idea yeah, and say, um, you know what, we're going to start sniffing everything <laughs> and we're going to identify vulnerabilities on the network and you know, kind of moving that way rather than just saying, well, everybody else is doing this, we're going to go off on this particular tangent. And it took a long time, you have to admit, mm -hmm. for passive vulnerability assessment to get to the point like we're just now starting to get good customers that are like, holy crap. We just found out we had a whole bunch of SCADA networks on our network in this RFC 1918 IP address range that we didn't even know was there. It existed, They're right. finally getting it. Yeah. But that was something you guys were working on like five, six years ago. And still right, no one really wants to that, go that. I thought you wrote PVS in a coffee shop. In <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. 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 Is, that, is that true? Is the, it true? The strip club in Vegas. The strip club in Vegas. On the Miracle Mile uh, at that time. Very I think good. there were about Very 10 good. questions in that, John. There was. No, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> So the thing is, passive passive monitoring has been going on for, for ages, right? So who, who does passive monitoring, right? NSA, Chinese Intel, uh, anybody who sits back and collects signals, right? I mean, uh, if you grew up... Uh, Running uh, the Dragon IDS? No, no, no. <laughs> Are we going to bring up Dragon? The, the idea of sitting back and letting 
the signals come to you and then do and tell. That's been going on for a long time, right? Message traffic and Napoleon did stuff like that, right? Yeah. So the idea that we can do that as the good guys is not a new concept, right? We were the first ones to really kind of say, let's look at the network and do it. Now, at the network layer, you get a lot of advantages, right? The first one is you don't have to ask anybody. All you have to do is get a span port, get a, get some some packets, and you're gone. Whereas if you want to do a pen test, if you want to do a scan, you want to install an agent, which I'm fans of, right? Tenable does all that. A lot of great companies out there do that. You have bureaucracy and technology and, and impact to, um, to to worry about. So doing that passive stuff's really good. But what happened in the last four or five years that really made passive sing is mobile devices, right? So is that mobile device going to come on and off my network? If it's BYOD or it's one of the cool things that you guys put together, I can't scan it. I don't know what it is. I got I to gotta see what's out there. And then the last thing is cloud. So if people are going to Salesforce, NetSuite, Dropbox, you know, whatever, the only way you can find those kind of apps is by looking at the network traffic. And so, then a lot of them, you don't even have authorization to scan. Right. Like you bring in somebody's personal device, you know, you, I didn't give you permission to scan my mobile device when it's on the network, so yeah. So, Ron, you've authored a series of papers on the attack path mm -hmm. and given presentations on catching penetration testers. What are some of the techniques that you describe in, in those works? Well, I think everybody at the table's done done pet, pen testing, right? Mm -hmm. And typically the conversation goes, hey, I want you to break in my network, what's your network, here's a list of targets. There's a lot of flaws in that, right? I actually did war dialing once when I worked at BBN and we war dialed the wrong numbers, right? Never so the, happens. Never happens, right? Uh, Breaking into the wrong website, you know, nope, things like that. Nope. So so being <laughs> the wrong able to, IP space. <laughs> yeah. So being able to look at the traffic, you uh, not only can identify the vulnerabilities, but you can see who's talking to who. If you can see who's talking to who, you know, I, we've we've all heard this stuff on Twitter, right? Somebody just does an assessment, they take a Nessus scan, they print it out, they 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 give it over. The reality is if you did the same thing with a passive assessment, you actually get a lot more directional attacks. So that could be real simple stuff. Which one of my internet facing servers are exploitable? What one of my clients that are browsing are exploitable? Those two things right there, you typically can't get from a pen test without really breaking in and figuring out those attack paths. And if you want to do it at scale, 10,000 computers, 100,000 computers, that's, that's passive is all about that. So I get asked this question a lot, Ron. I'm curious to your answer. Where's your suit? No. Yeah. <laughs> in in the sea of vulnerability and log data, how do I know which vulnerabilities and log entries are the ones that matter? The ones that are red. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most, the That's highest the secret, CVSS right? score, right? right? The ones that are over this severity. number, four point two. Um, so I ask a lot of people a lot of a lot of different questions, right? And one of the questions I really like to ask, I blogged about, right, is have you ever found a, mal a, a virus, a malware with, with Nessus? And the reactions I get from people is really, really interesting, right? Because if you're doing a vulnerability assessment or a penetration test or an audit, you want to audit 100% of the software that's there, whether it came from a vendor, whether it came from a, uh, a you know, Al Qaeda, whether it came from, you know, somebody who compiled an open source, act, you need 100%, right? So it changes the mindset. So when people start looking at what's a vulnerability and, and what's a log of interest, it gets really, really subjective pretty, pretty quick. Another thing I like to ask them is when they have a SIM, how much bureaucracy, how much, uh, how much, well, whatever, how much level of effort, right? It takes yeah. physics to move packets, run agents, mm -hmm. set the firewall rules up, store them, make sure the databases are running and stuff like that. And even on a day when it all works, are you covering 100% of your network? A lot of times when you get one or two pay grades above the person who bought the SIM or is running the SOC, you run into things like, well, we're only really, at the end of the day, we're only looking at firewall and uh, network IDS logs. We're not looking at agents, right? And that's the kind of stuff that really freaks people out at the high level. They say, hey, I spent $2 million on this log management solution. I'm protected. I'm secure because I spent money. So a lot of times when you get back to when do I find the attacks, well, are you even looking for them in the, in the first place? That's really where I, well, I push back on. And it's interesting because a lot of organizations, whenever they talk about their SIM, like if you go and you talk to the Security Operations Center, many times they like to brag about how much data they're collecting. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, we're collecting, you know, half a terabyte a yep. day or a terabyte a day. It's like, well, what does that, that, that doesn't, that's not even wrong. Like, you don't, a... you don't even know what that means. <laughs> so one of the things that's interesting is you tar started talking about threat intelligence and things of that nature. And uh, was at that uh, CISO forum that we were talking about. And we brought up threat intelligence and one of the CISO said, no one can sell me an intelligence product. Only a human being can provide mm -hmm. intelligence. The only thing you can do is giving me meaningful data which I can make intelligent decisions with. And I think that's what's fundamentally mm -hmm. missing because a lot of things, they, they base it on, you know, log everything and let ArcSight sort it out. 
and they'll just do it for you. But that's not intelligence. So how do you actually make that transition from a tremendous amount of data that organizations collect to actually making it actionable level data that they can make intelligent decisions based on? So if I say, I'm going to say another C word, and we can all just get our cups. Because oh, I got of, it. Right. I got yeah, it. Right. Everybody right. prepare. Com yeah. Compliance. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. So mm. the way I tell the that story. That was very tasty. Tasty compliance. The way, the way I tell the story. <laughs> What if we got all I love the, the taste of compliance in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> what if we got all the penetration testers in the world against? Hey guys and ladies, you know, let's let's write down how we break in and what we should do, right? What if we got all the incident response people together and said, "All right, all these incident response, what, what should we do to protect things?" Right? Well, if you look at PCI, if you look at the SANS now CIS controls, if you look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, that's what they did. I think some of us have helped out with that, right? So it's not rocket science, right? If you don't know about something, you can't protect something. So you got to do asset management, right? You got to patch and have your configs. You got to have a plan. And we have a whole thing to go through this. It's really your guide for, for, for doing things, right? You don't want people making things up as they're going along. I always talk about airplanes, right? You don't want to be taken off on an airplane and say, hey, it's Southwest flight, you know, 111. Today we're flying out some new wings. You, you just don't, you don't do that. You want to have repeatable and measurable types of things that will save you and, uh, you know, make sure you have 100% of your network covered and monitored and looking for bad guys. It's not the exciting thing, but that's the problem. The industry has been well, looking but, but, for the black box, the exciting, see, sexy thing to plug in and so, be secure. But how do you We're never going to do it. How do you make that transition as a vendor where you have customers that are like, well, we want you to do is sell us the easy button. And we just click this easy button and things work. And you can't sell them that. It's exactly like you said. You can't. The only thing you can do is give them data. They have to take it to that next so step. So the way we, we, we get there as an industry is we don't speak to the CSO anymore, <laughs> right? We speak to the CFO. We speak to the CEO. And the cool thing that's going on right now is because of, you know, Ashley Madison, because of Edward Snowden, because of Sony, because of all the different things going on, it's a boardroom level conversation, right? And as a vendor, I will tell you that, you know, people are really worried about this. They're investing in it. I've seen companies actually do their first enterprise-wide vulnerability scan, even though it's 2015. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, we need to drag people in here, right? At the same time, there's still people vulnerable to heartbleed. You know, so so we need to all work together and move that forward. Uh, we can drink to that. Did I say we? Did I really say we have yeah, to all work said, together? Yeah, wait, <laughs> you said happily. As but, soon as you keep synergizing or yep, leveraging, yep, yep. we're just in trouble. Yeah, synergy. No, wait, it's not just me that drinks a lot during the Rangula interview. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, you, so you know, one of the, one of the gaps is missing. Um, oh. I, I'll let you get in there yeah, in yeah. a minute. Though, My, I think, mine's completely off topic, but that's yeah, fine. But that's okay. <laughs> but I think that John was trying to get to, and, and something that we we struggle a lot uh, with in Black Hills, and we try to get to is how do we how do we amp up the human intelligence side right mm -hmm. because there's so many appliance solutions there's so much data analytics out there there's so much availability of good information mm -hmm. that is just not being adequately used and so how do we in in our various organizations large and small actually amp up the human intelligence side and, and enable the the uh you know in many times really motivated humans mm -hmm. to, to do the right thing and channel that information in the right way so there's a couple a couple comments there so so one if you go back to that Fitbit analogy, you're really, your goal isn't to patch everything and have the right firewall rules for one day. Your goal is to change behavior, right? And if you can get the culture to change, to understand that plugging in a box, <laughs> adding a user, using shadow IT is bad for the, if, if it's bad for you, because your organization might be all well and good to do that. The idea is to have, change that culture, right? Technically though, the things that I've been happy with the last couple of years, most sims, are IP-based focused, right? If you get an anomaly, it's about an IP address, things like that. Mm -hmm. There's been a big resurgence in insider threat monitoring tools. I don't want to drop a bunch of vendors, but if you went to RSA or Black Hat, there's a bunch of things that look like SIMs, but they're actually user behavioral monitoring things, and you can do some pretty advanced um, things. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of organizations that have deployed these, and you've, you start finding stuff. The problem is you start finding things like, hey, um, uh, you know, Larry, let's see, you printed a lot yesterday. Uh, you've you've never printed a lot before, and we also saw that you went to the the, the hot job site or something like that, right? I haven't looked for a job in like 20 years. Well, well, where do people go to look for jobs? I don't know. Re resumes and hundred dollar bills. Yeah, right? there, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and literally, you get a visit from HR, right? And that, that's some organizations that are doing that, right? Now that's kind of one problem. Somebody stealing your secret sauce or your source code is a completely different problem. But but is it is that necessary? I mean, I, that's that's problematic to find those other things that that overlap into mm -hmm. this space. But mm -hmm. um, not necessarily a bad thing, I don't think. And and potentially um, 
uh, potentially a positive outcome. So uh, I think that's, you know, that's actually a good thing. What, what happens is we're all turning into the NSA, right? Everybody yeah. who's a privacy <laughs> right. advocate, if you want to do security, you have to monitor your people. You have to basically watch what they're doing, log what they're doing, do kernel level monitoring, keystroke logging, packet logging. And a lot of people are, you know, they, they get offended at turning into what they what they despise, right? There, there's certainly, uh, certainly a, a, the privacy impact mm -hmm. um, certainly is, is a big issue. That was when you I was, I was about NSA to start on yeah, what? No, yeah. <laughs> Time, okay, so I believe Larry nice had a question or, while he's peeling back his sticker. So, yeah, she's it, taking we, off we are the we're, built for Windows 2000 sticker. I want this for my next computer. We were, we were, <laughs> we were talking about the, uh, uh, the, the quote, drinking, and uh, I teach a module in 617, and it's called the Key Drinking Game. <laughs> and it's when we talk about WPA2, pre-shared key. Yeah. And key begat key begat key begat key. And uh, I had one of my students record the number of times they said key in the one and a half hour <laughs> module, and it was 140 times. Wow. Wow. So that's a lot of drinks. I, I just say cyber to that. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ron, you brought up an interesting uh, point before that I think a lot of us experience in our day-to-day in our -day of moving away from the CSO and moving more towards the non-technical side of the mm -hmm. boardroom or other non-technical people they have to interface with. Do you have any tips for people going to that for the first time? Because uh, you know many of the, the conversations we're having now are directly because of these big name stories, mm -hmm. the Sony, the Edward Snowden, et cetera, et cetera. What, what you would, uh, advice would you give to somebody who now has to go in front of that boardroom that's not a technical person? So, uh, so, so two tips, right? So the first tip is you will have some sort of cyber event. At a moment's notice, being able to explain to, uh, did I, oh, I said cyber? Ooh. Sorry. Oh, man. 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 Paul and I were right on it. I mean, we, were, we just we went right straight in. Yeah. 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 Why are they drinking? They want to drink. Oh, I said it. I said it. Right, right. So two steps. So the first thing, you will have some sort of event. It's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? You need to have the uh, what you want in a 30-second soundbite. So when you're in the elevator with the CEO, when you're, you're doing a stogie on a Friday afternoon, where you can actually articulate something that's going to change and shift the, the, the company uh, or the organization. Most people have sort of an acquisition in their hip pocket. They want to get a better sandbox, hire a great penetration testing team from, from the folks at the table. Shoot higher, right? Str look for some bigger policy type of, uh, type of change. Now, the second one is a mentality thing. This actually came from uh, our VP of IT. Uh, the, the basic comp or, uh, uh, quote is, is you want to maximize value and reduce risk. And basically, if you think about that, how do you maximize value? And this is the one everybody at the table is going to freak out, a lot of we're, listeners. Where's Santarcangelo? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we need him right now. It's about, I, I did that one for Santarcangelo. It's about reducing applications, right? So the big oh, problem with vulnerability reduce management your foot, reduce your, reduce is your footprint. To, you want to reduce yeah. your footprint. Now, yeah. at Tenable, we did an audit with the PVS, right? had like six or seven chat systems, right? Now, of course, if you go down to one <clears throat> chat system, it's easier to manage. But are you really, with six systems, you're being good, you're letting everybody use it, but is that, are you maximizing the value for your company? You're not, right? And if you're on different payroll systems, different healthcare systems, different email systems, different Windows laptops, you know, things like that, Microsoft la uh, laptops and whatnot, you're really not maximizing value. You're doing the opposite. You're making it more difficult for people to to do to get things done and stuff like that. So but those I, two so things are really what I. So you mentioned something that's kind of kind of becoming a pet peeve in me. Mm -hmm. Is you talk about software, mm -hmm. and I consider it to be like a snowball of crap. Every yeah. year it goes by, you collect more software and more mm -hmm. software and so more software. And your attack, your attackable footprint is much larger every single year than it was the previous year because right. you're refusing to get rid of software and, and kind of shed it. And, but it's a bigger issue than that. Like, you know, we tie it into vulnerability assessments. And one of the things that's interesting to me is I sit back and I watch all of the pen tests that the testers are doing at BHIS, and I'm noticing a very disturbing trend. And that's a fact of, you know, what is it for PCI for the CV uh, scores that you have to address? It's like 4.2. CVSS is like. It's 4.7 yeah. or 4.2, yep, yep, yep. 4.5 and above. Those mm -hmm. are the ones you got to take care of. Right. And meanwhile, every single year, those lower levels that are below that threshold and below are just getting ignored. And every year, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by and large, we're actually breaking into a large number of organizations through those lower level vulnerabilities mm -hmm. because they've been ignored for so very long. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, they're just informational. Like directory indexing is one of our all-time favorites. I mean, that's the easiest one that people can look John at. John did a happy dance when I showed him in Nessus how you can change the severity oh, oh, oh. of a particular <laughs> yeah, plugin. Yeah, I actually yeah. went in to, uh, to our Nessus instance, mm -hmm. and I changed the severity to be critical. So every one of my testers now, when they see that, they're like, oh, oh, oh God, that's critical. I got to look 
at that. And you're getting in <laughs> again and again and again. Um, if you have informational identifying a, a Telnet server by mm -hmm. its banner, you look at that banner and then you figure out what the default password is and you can actually try to break into it and things like that. Yep. And I just, it, it's not just software, but look at you know an organization that's been going for 10 years and ignoring anything that's medium and lower. Just look at this massive number of vulnerabilities that continues to swell. Mm -hmm. um, do you and think that there would be a place to say, look, you know, your low level vulnerabilities is now 10 times what it was when we started scanning. We might want to start cutting through those. How can organizations even begin to approach those mediums and those lows that there's critical issues in there, but they have to start digging through that data to actually Companies I talk to are like, I don't, I don't have time for those. And that's wrong, by the way. Yeah. That's yeah. not true. And I'll get to that. Go and when ahead. You, so I go back to compliance, right? And we can all... Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> lots of drinking. Wow. I We're saw it coming. We're going to be toasted by the end of Ron Gula's hour. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome so, to the club. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the question is, what are, you, what are you trying to protect, right? So if you've got an open Telnet server, it's behind five firewalls. You know, the only people who are doing admin on it are inside that network connecting to it. That might be acceptable risk. Until they get fished. Until they get fished, right. So the question is, is how are they going to get fished? what is the biggest risk to your network? So this goes back to the attack path, it goes mm -hmm. back to your defenses. You need to audit your targets and your defenses simultaneously. Too many people focus on just the vulnerabilities. And then you get into these conversations of, well, let me patch all the red, or you know what, there's a bunch of, 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 of mediums there and stuff like that. I would go, I've, I've always wanted to do this with, uh, uh, with, with Nessus, is that start predicting vulnerabilities. Well, based on the past five years of releases from Microsoft, even if you're fully patched, you've still got all this other stuff to worry about, right? Yeah. Most people don't realize that, right? Or so even you, looking at a system that has a ridiculous number of mediums and saying, this one is a statistical right. anomaly. So the question is, is, what impacts your network? And this is where the attack path analysis, this is where the baseline compliance standards go for. Most organizations have a sense that they're not going to fix everything. Therefore, they deploy defenses to compensate for that. But they never audit the entire thing at the same time. And you know, we all accept a certain amount of risk when we have a cigar, have a drink, drive, fly, whatever, right? Um, we need to have that same level of risk exceptions on networks, but we have to understand it with much, much, much greater clarity and sophistication, which is what Tenable does. Thank you for the setup. So, but, but, <laughs> but it's, I think it goes into more than that. Um, if you remember years ago, there was a plugin, like a third party plugin for displaying vulnerabilities, and it was displaying by vulnerability ID. And now that's baked into it. So now, whenever you kick it out the export, it basically says you can sort this by plugin ID and vulnerability ID. And one of the things that's very, very frustrating with a lot of other tools, because we use a lot of them, is let's use the Telnet example. Let's say you're testing the outside of an organization that has 8,000 IP addresses, and they have hundreds of Telnet servers. Well, if all of their Telnet servers are the exact same thing for their ISP, and it's like the exact same, whenever you look at all those vulnerabilities, you can quickly go through them. You can say, this is the same, and I know that that's not a vulnerability. It's just... it's. You know, it's not that big of a deal. And it's like the Telnet server, Telnet server, Telnet server, Telnet server, Telnet server, and it goes on hundreds. And you see Polycom Telnet server. That one is different. You're like, that's fundamentally different than any of the other mm -hmm. ones. And usually those discrepancies and that texture is where you find your vulnerabilities. Same thing with directory indexing, robots.txt, anything. And the ability to see all of that information, be it low or informational, is how you go through looking at those lows and informationals very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we use constantly. And that's why we can go through thousands of vulnerabilities <coughs> very, very quickly instead of you know going by each individual IP address, sorting by vulnerability. And yep. I think that that's all about giving data to people so they can can make intelligent decisions about what's in front of them. Yep. Rather and than telling and, them and John, that's some of my favorite things to do on a pen test oh, is, yeah. is, you know, hit the highs, go figure, yeah. uh, or more importantly, hit the criticals, look at the highs, and then go to informational and low and work your way up. Yep. Yeah, because yeah. that, that whole blog post many years ago that we've talked about over and over again from low to owned. Yep. You don't know yeah, how many Chris times Gates. that low to yep. owned works for me. So, so low to own is absolutely a reality, and it's something <laughs> that, that, that you should do. But then what you end up is in your, your vulnerability scan or your pen test becomes in charge of what you should be patching and yeah. doing. You really should have a different patching policy at that point, because if you're going to put Tenable in charge of that, you know, maybe we missed something, right? I mean, we, sure. we, we were one of the best in the industry, but you know, 
that's not how you should manage your but, network. But that's just it, though. A lot of times they would like to say, well, mm -hmm. let's say I get in through some kind of vulnerability. You use directory indexing or a telnet server or whatever. You get in through that, right? And a lot of people like to blame the tool. They're like, well, Hocum Nessus or whatever tool didn't tell me about that vulnerability. Because it's a tool. It gives you data. It mm -hmm. still requires a human being to go through that data and analyze it. And you've got to find the best tool to give you the data that you can go through the quickest. And yep. this, this is where we get into continuous not monitoring, right? So continuous mm -hmm. monitoring isn't the Wait, concept. Do we have to drink now? Yes, oh, we it's oh. <laughs> we, we'll, we'll drink anyway. And, and John, I've got a great follow-up question to, to some of your stuff. Cool. So a lot of times where I talk about this, I say, well, are you worried about going to the cloud? And a lot of people say, oh, you know, if I put my data, you know, whatever cloud vendor you want, Salesforce, Amazon, you know, things like that, people are like, well, I, I lose the data. It's actually a lot more secure up there because if you're going with a cloud provider that does one thing, they, they do email, they do SQL, they do, they do DNS mm -hmm. hosting. All they have to do, they're, they're sitting there running thousands and thousands of binds, right? Thousands and thousands of H Apaches or whatever. If there's a vulnerability, if something's behaving odd, they're going to see that, right? It's a lot easier to see. But when you go back to your network and you're running, you know, Exchange and MySQL yeah. and this Jive thing and the Cisco, it's very difficult to see anomalies see, and stuff I, like I that. Disagree. I, and the reason no, I disagree. No, I disagree. I agree. I think cloud, as Ron describes it, well, more secure. So, there's so, two so different so ways to look at it. So says the tenable So if you're using Despite cloud, that, yeah, I, yeah, still, yeah. I still I, if I agree. If you're using like Google Shut Apps, up, absolutely, I agree 110%. <laughs> if you're using Salesforce, absolutely, I, I agree with that 110%. But then people confuse that. With and like they say, Amazon. Or Amazon. Yeah, no, so I agree. I'm going to go to the marketplace it's, it's the, and I'm going to get an Elasticsearch 0.3.2 yeah. instance. What's, what's and the Chris Hoff? Uh, well, it's the, he's, got, he's got all the different cloud. I, I yeah. It's the difference yeah. between infrastructure yeah. as service versus software as a service. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's, yeah. The yeah. Key. that's the key. But still, the, so, the Amazon pays but, attention to the hypervisor. They make sure that yeah. stuff is locked. So, absolutely. I mean, but Ron's point is salient in the software as a service space because that that is true that they are focused on that particular mission that's at that particular app layer. And yes, they're going to see that at scale. So, so I have a couple so customers in the, in the federal government who run like 100 exchange servers. Yep. And they run those things tight. And if one of them gets hacked, they're going to find it based on the anomalies compared mm -hmm. to the other exchange servers, right? Now, of course, you're waiting to get hacked at that point and, 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 and whatnot. But if you have one exchange server, you can look for anomalies all day. Your usage is going to drive anomalies. You're never going to see an attack based on anomaly detection. Yeah, yeah. So my question, Ron, along this topic is, as organizations move to the cloud and software as a service, if you look at, I mean, if you're any startup today, you're not going to have any IT infrastructure mm -hmm. locally, right? It's all going to be in the cloud. It's all going to be software as a service. How will that change IT security as we know it today? So that's a, uh, that's a great question, right? And it basically, there's tools out there today to audit that stuff. It, it doesn't absolve the responsibility to have somebody think about their, their data, right? So if you have Salesforce, if you have NetSuite, if you have uh, Amazon, you know, two of those are software as a service, one of them's infrastructure as mm -hmm. a service. So you need to approach the infrastructure as a service folks the same way you approach IT. Scan it, log it, audit it, and do that. When you go to a Salesforce or a NetSuite, you don't do a web app scan at salesforce.com, right? But you still can Unless they have a bug bounty, but <laughs> right, that's right, a different right. thing. Yeah. Um, right. But you can absolutely audit its config, Mm -hmm. You can absolutely gather logs. You can absolutely audit who's, who's on there, look for usage, and there's lots of solutions in that space. Tenable's been doing a lot of work there. So you Most do the same things, it's just in a different environment, right? Absolutely. This, the, I stole that from Matt Alderman, and I were having yeah, that conversation. The, probably yeah. the best conversation or compliment I think somebody ever gave NASA is they were looking at the audits. They're like, wow, the audits for Salesforce are the same process and easy as my audits for FireEye, Cisco, and yeah, Linux. I'm like, yeah, yes. why would they be different? Yeah. You know? yeah. you know? They think and somehow it's going to, like, you're going to have to slaughter a different chicken right. and a different dance. Absolutely. You know? Well, I mean, technically you do, but yeah, true. that's because Ron's got stock in the chicken industry. But, my, <laughs> <laughs> but I think the point is, I think that it's a better mechanism for security because I don't have to necessarily, I can't audit the lower layers, mm -hmm. I trust that Salesforce is going to take care of that, and it's in their best interest to do that. So I don't have to worry about that. I can focus more on the application, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is where I think we're lacking today. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many systems do you guys break into where it's the application's fault this, yeah. that you broke in? Yeah. Oh, well, the, there the was another point that Ron, the, the Ron brought home, and, and that is just because you're, you're leveraging an infrastructure as a service or a software as a service mm -hmm. provider, it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility to protect, protect the data that is core to your business. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, um, back on the whole low and medium and exploitation, absolutely, right? And I'd love to say that we gotta patch everything, right? That's not gonna happen. If, if you don't design the network, it's, it's, it's not gonna work, that, that, that's gonna be there. But people are somehow stunned that these exploits happen 
and they're not detected by their SIM or their network IDS, yeah. when simple rules like, let's do outbound firewall filtering. You know, hey, all of these computers over here are supposed to speak to this DNS server. When they talk to me on port 53, let's throw up an alert, right? Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of lean forward customers do that, but most people don't. They don't think about if I'm compromised and, 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 and whatnot. So I, I, that's, that's how I like to approach that question. You need to mitigate those, yep. those lows and mediums by looking for them to be exploited. Yep. And uh, kind of kind of you know moving forward, how do you feel like you know Google's cloud security scanner and inspector are actually going to change things moving forward? Is it really a big change? How is it different from what's actually happening? Because I see a lot of confusion. People are like, well, I don't need something like like Nessus because I can just go get this. And I don't think they understand the history and the backlog and the amount of work that goes into a scanner. Absolutely. So, so yeah. how, do, how do you feel? It's, uh, it so changes I'm, a great things. question, John. I am more than happy to have other people bring approaches to, to scanning and auditing. You mentioned Google. Uh, there was uh, some open source uh, web app scanning out there. You know, Amazon's doing base checking of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, so I think the more, the more the better, right? But they should definitely understand that those are minimum, not even minimum, you won't, be, you won't even be PCI compliant with those technologies, but it helps. Mm -hmm. And a lot of organizations are cash strapped, they are resourced. So the more it can be built into the infrastructure, the more it can be continuous, um, the, the more, you know, <laughs> the, the more I'm happy for that kind of security. Well, <sighs> and one of my happy things is a lot of these services coming out have taken a lot of the cloud pen testing services and just flushed them out. Because people are like, well, we don't need to get a cloud pen testing service, we can now use somebody else. And I think like that's, us. that's nice. So that's nicer. Yeah. Ron's made us drink so much that Apollo is bringing us new drinks. Wow. Yeah, thanks, Apollo. <laughs> you're, you're a champ. <laughs> thanks, Ron. <laughs> Maybe. Continu con continuous cyber. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yes. oh, Cheers. Two drinks. Yeah. Hey, I finished my drink. <laughs> oh, my God. Ooh, wow. Oh, wow. That is delicious. Oh. New drink. That's jump. I'm Ooh. going to die of alcohol poisoning. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Ron, what's your favorite science fiction novel? Wow. Now... Whoa. I'm not one of these people who say Game of Thrones is, is science fiction and stuff like that. Right, but the yeah, one, it's more fantasy than it, science it fiction. Is. It is. Actually, he, he, he it says it's, it's a form of science fiction. But the, the last book that I read that, that totally blew me away was Ready Player One. Oh. Yeah, it blew me away. I mean, Did you it, read that Steven Spielberg is removing all of the references to his movies from the movie that he's making? It, that's from, from Ready Player I have one. not heard that. Okay. Yeah, he did. So, what's so the, I, I so haven't read now, Ready Player I, 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 I need to read, read this. I we'll talk read about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Have, you, have you read the follow-up uh, the, the follow work? The Armada. quote, the follow-up? Yes. Armada? Armada. Have you read Armada? Yes. I just downloaded it What did you think? Uh, if Ready Player One is a 10, Armada is an 8. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And still, no, you, you an, eight, like an 8 is a solid read. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So it was a very fast read. I I tend to read like Agreed. Asimov and stuff like that, which is yep. like yeah, well, it's a slow read. <sighs> okay. That's a slow read. Yeah, I gotta think about that. <laughs> Deep breath. Uh, so, uh, favorite science fiction movie recently that you've seen? Oh, recently, you love you love wow. science fiction Ooh, movies. You're always um, telling me about the latest science fiction have movie. You see, have you seen The Martian? I have not seen The Martian. Okay, I haven't seen I am, it, but I read the book. Yes. Did you read the book? No. Oh, no, last that, time you, that, last that, no questions. I ne like next, it. <laughs> next, next on the list. That's your homework. <laughs> the Martian, very the Martian. good. You were very talking about good. Ender's Game. Ender's Game's a good book. Yeah, uh, good like book it. and a good movie. Or I, I like it. The, the read thing. the book and watch the movie. Right. Oh, read the book. Definitely, first. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah. definitely, yeah. definitely read the book. <laughs> yeah. Always read. I mean, the book. I, I'm a big one of these. Like, like with the Matrix. You know, I always felt Matrix was a simulation in a simulation. Right. So mm -hmm. if you guys ever watch uh, Rick and Morty, for example, I love uh, Rick and Morty. Yes, they when they abduct him and they put him in a simulation and he breaks out of the simulation. The, the Zygerian yeah. scammers. Yes, the, the worst ones in, in the in the universe, right? And he breaks out of, into another simulation, right? And they're like, oh, we got you. And he breaks out again, third simulation, right? I love that kind of science fiction mm -hmm. humor, good good stuff like that. Yeah. Nice. Paul looks a little confused. I don't know. Rick and Morty. You simulation I, of a no, simulation. You need to watch of Rick no, and Morty. I get that. Well, I was actually looking recently because The Matrix was on TV all the time, and yep. I'm like, I've seen this movie a lot. I'm like, what mm -hmm. other works have influenced them? All the martial arts movies I've seen. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Probably more than once. Uh, definitely. Um, definitely. Definitely oh, more yeah, than they, once. They talk about so what I, their influence I really liked yeah. Ex Machina. That, uh, that was good. I that, really it, enjoyed that. That was one I, of those I love the dance scene. I don't know how they shot Which that. Which freaked me yep, out. That was like, a really good dance scene. When they got to that, yep. I was just like, there, this is really and, and that was funny because Josh Wright and I were on the same some of the same flights, and he said Ex Machina was awesome. And then there's another one. That's very similar vein, and I can't remember the name, but I can find that was more of the love story. And he said that was 
creepy and that we should never oh, oh the one her her, her. 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 yes yeah her. yeah yeah that's actually creepier yeah, I think. yeah. yeah. See, this is oh, why yeah. i'm glad it's recorded because now i now can, you go, can back. go back it's good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. um so speaking of the matrix i got to go to sydney recently and mm-hmm. yep. going over to sydney seeing customers and stuff like that and uh, got hey. an awesome hat when i was down there you got to see the fountain and they stopped me and they're like this you recognize fountain. this this is the, fount- like, the fountain with the woman with the red yeah, dress. I'm like, where's the where's the blonde with the red dress? Like, yeah. oh, we oh, couldn't come oh, up nice. with that. So, so yeah. that was kind of cool. That's awesome. I specifically went there to see. Well, I went when I walked around Sydney. We went there yeah, you, to see you, that. You fountain. ought to have a better reason to go to Sydney. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then to see the fountain. That, <laughs> that next time you're back, go to Chinatown, and I can get the name of the restaurant for you. But there's a restaurant in Chinatown where the local the local Chinese go to get their fish, and they have them in the tanks right there when you're eating. And they have great uh, deep fried squab. What kind of cyber security do they have at those tanks? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just everybody pick up that drink. <laughs> pick, <laughs> pick and run devices. <laughs> pick and run. Pick and so run. So, Ron, you have not answered the five questions in yes. some time. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Three words to describe yourself. Oh, helpful, fun, and imaginative. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? An axe. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, man, fun and games? In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Uh, either one's fine as long as I can use both hands. <laughs> oh, <laughs> best answer of the year. <laughs> Love well, it. Well, well it. played. Well played. Well played. <laughs> Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Here it comes. Mother Teresa and Darth Vader. <laughs> nice. That's, Whoa. Those are my parents. Oh, okay. <laughs> You've met them. That's exactly. <laughs> Bro- I was going to say brothers uh, from a mother, another, uh, another mother, but wait, no, brothers from the same mother. Uh. <laughs> so, what, oh, what new Star Wars movie? Anticipated? You think you're going to like it, hate it, love it? It's going to be great. Back I, 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 I love the entertainment. Rock. It's going to be good. I'm, I'm all for it. All right. So, yes. speaking of Star Wars, yes. I had somebody tell me yesterday. Mike Poor, for example, said, have you watched Star Wars Machete? No. Like, and now I'm Googling it. Yes. <laughs> so it is not a movie. It is the order in which you are supposed to watch Star Wars. Ah, uh, mm. okay. Yeah, 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 we, yeah, we read that because there's yeah. uh, an exec uh, producer here at yes. Security Weekly that has not watched Star Wars. Yes. And so we, we were... Who didn't watch Star Wars? Uh, it was it's Chris. Chris. <laughs> Remain nameless. Chris. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he must be a youngster. Yeah. 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 So it is, uh, it is an order in which you are to watch the Star Wars trilogy are, in fact, six films. Six films. And in, in turn, in Machete, it is only five, five films. Five films. So you skip one entirely. You, you completely yeah. throw away episode one because yep. it has no valuable information to the story. Is Correct. Machete, like, in it? Do they no, the no. Episode, no, the episode order <laughs> yeah, What's his name? What's the actor's name? Oh, machete. <laughs> so Anyone? you see four. Yeah. Yep. And then you see five. Yep. And then you see two. two then three. three then, then six. six. And then yep. you're supposed to play one. like Pink Floyd the Wall while you watch yeah. the first yeah. <laughs> While you watch it at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Right whenever the lion roars, you start it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so you never watch. So the only re- quote redeeming values of episode one are. Yeah, they go into uh, those. Midichlorians mm-hmm. and Jar Jar. <laughs> That's it. How I'm not re- sure that Jar Jar And those, and those are not <laughs> redeeming values. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they make no sense to the rest of the story. There is one appearance My of Jar Jar in episode two. Brief. And it is brief and it is unrelated to the rest of the story. All right. See, uh, so, what does Amran Tutankhamun have to do with hacking? Oh. oh. Wait, wait, you starting history. Hacker Jeopardy already? <laughs> this feels like, it feels like a trick question. I, I'm going to say I don't know because. So, um, he's an actor. Yeah. He was in Night at the Museum. Okay. Oh. He's also on Mr. Robot. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Love yeah. Mr. Robot. I just yeah. like saying Amron Tutankhamen. So I think, yeah, it sounds cool. <laughs> I bet he ran SSH yep. nuke sometime, didn't he? That's <laughs> what happened. Yeah, it's like the Bishop jump, Fox jump, tools, jump, the, jump. the diggity tools. Sometimes <laughs> I just say them, even though they haven't been updated in a while. It's like, oh, well, you can check out Flash Diggity and DLP Diggity and Search Diggity and Bing Diggity. I like Diggity, so I say it a lot. Diggity. diggity. It just sounds cool. Family, Ron, family guy reference. Cool. Right? Thank you very much for coming on Security <laughs> hey, Weekly. Congratulations to 10 years of um, here, here. cyber security. Cyber weekly, security. Right? Cyber Amen. security. Cheers. 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 And, and Ron didn't drink. He only raised his glass. a kick-ass product so we don't have to destroy you. Thank we you. Appreciate Thank you. That. Absolutely. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank you for all the, uh, the users and the lovers out there. We're going to take a short break. Come back and have our interview that was pre-recorded with Peter Zacto, a.k.a. Mudge. <gasps> we'll be coming up next. <laughs> oh, I wish I knew it was pre-recorded because I would have... I was excited because I... 
Oh. You can 